If you become confused at the time this morning, you've got your choice. You can either be 12.35, uh, 11.35, or the real time is actually 10.35. So, so when Matt's speaking, don't judge the end time. Well, let's stand as we allow God to address us through his word. This is God speaking to us this morning. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. This morning we come to worship a God who has a love that is steadfast towards us. We have a God who has a covenant of peace towards us that shall not be removed. Whatever we're feeling like this morning, God will be faithful to us in his love and his peace. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you that you are a God who loves us with a steadfast, everlasting love, a covenant love towards us. Thank you, Lord, for this promise that his love shall not depart from us. Lord, thank you for the peace that you give us, the peace that passes all understanding. And thank you, Lord, that again you promised A covenant of peace should not be removed. Why? Because you have compassion on us. And so, Father, we thank you this morning. We have this opportunity to come and praise you. As our first song says, come and praise and glorify the living God. Lord, would you be honoured in our praise and in our worship this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
children's book that goes through Psalm 139 and I was reminded of that this morning as we sang all we have all we need is you sometimes God feels far away Psalm 139 verse 7 where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence he is there with us everywhere Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. He is there with you in every circumstance, every situation, even when we don't feel that presence near to you. He is there with you, making the darkness come to light. Turn your eyes to the morning. Turn your eyes to the morning and see.
This morning, Lord, we get to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Lord, this morning we get to realize again afresh, Lord, that our measureless debt was, was paid. And Lord, as Tim just reminded us, Lord, Father, when we look, and Lord, we can't sometimes see, Lord, we know, Lord, that you're Love is ever towards us, Lord. Lord, shining brightly, Lord. Father, thank you for this, this truth this morning as well, Lord. Amen. Would you like to take your seats? So... Wish any visitors here a, a very warm welcome. We are really pleased that you are here with us today. So a few, uh, a few announcements for the coming, well, this coming week, really. It's, it's home groups this week. So I'm sure your group leader will be in touch for any, uh, any further information. But yeah, groups as normal on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then uh, a bit of an advance notice, there's a church meeting on the 12th of November um, as well. So I'm guessing that's a Wednesday. It's a Tuesday. Whoa, all right. That threw me. Church meeting on a Tuesday. Will, will it? I resound, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, church meeting Tuesday, the 12th of November at Resound. And then just another um, reminder about the Operation Christmas Child. Um, the boxes are in the, in the foyer. Uh, again, um, the, you can drop the boxes off um, to the hub office anytime between the 11th and the 18th of November but we'll also um, if you want to bring them here on Sunday the 17th uh, we'll we'll take them away there um, all the information is on online but if you have got any questions Karen or Laura can be on hand to answer those tricky questions but but check it all out on the Operation Christmas Child website if you have any any questions but this is a, a really great opportunity to bless children who would not get gifts otherwise so let's be let's be generous and uh, and get some of those boxes filled up that'd be that'd be great okay so today in our in our prayer together we want to really want to give thanks for last week's baptisms and also to give thanks for all those who visited and then there were a number of those who are not yet christians we want to we want to pray pray for them this morning also we want to pray with and there's i know there's a number of uh, folk um, in our church and in this congregation who are, who are not well. So we want to pray for God's um, touch on them. And also we want to, want to pray for uh, Nick and Rachel this morning and Riley, Hope and Elsie as they mourn on the anniversary of, of Alfie going to be with the Lord. So we want to pray for God's comfort on them and the, and the wider family as well. So would you, and we'll pray for God's word as Matt brings God's word to us this morning. So would you would you join me in prayer? Uh, dear Lord, we want to give thanks for the baptismal service last week. And for all those who were baptized, we ask, Lord, that would you continue to strengthen them in their faith. And Father, we do want to give thanks, Lord, that this hall was full. 
and that were those who joined us who are not yet Christians. And we pray that those gospel seeds that have been sown, Lord, that will, they will grow, Lord. And Lord, would those seeds, Lord, come to fruition. Lord, we ask that you would continue to do your work in these lives. And may they come to faith in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask that many more will give their lives to you and want to be baptized. And Lord, we ask that more and more would this hall be full with folk eager to hear the good news of the gospel. Lord, we thank you that you are at work to save the lost. And we rejoice when they hear the good news of salvation. Lord, would you help us to be your faithful witnesses in our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools, colleges, universities, and homes. And now, Lord, we do want to pray, Lord, for all those who are sick, Lord, in our church and in this congregation. Lord, may you bring healing to them, Lord, and may they know your peace and comfort, Lord, at this time of trial. Lord, may they know your love. And Lord, we do want to pray for Nick and Rachel, Lord, for Riley, Hope, and Elsie this morning, Lord. We want to pray, Lord, that you would comfort them, Lord. Father, you would come alongside them, Lord, and, and give them peace, Lord, at, at this time, Lord. Father, we do thank you, Lord, Lord, that we know Alfie is with you, Lord, and we know, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life, Lord. So, Father, these truths comfort us this morning, Lord, but we do pray particularly, Lord, that you would continue to bring your comfort, Lord. And Father, Lord, we do or pray for Matt, Lord, as he brings your word, Lord. Father, it's not his, his words, Lord, but, but Father, it's your word that you bring to us this morning, Lord. And Father, may you help us, Lord, to listen attentively, Lord. And Father, would you speak to each one of us this morning, Lord, with your life-giving word, we pray. Amen. Uh, Grace Kids this morning, I believe. So if you guys want to head on out. There we go. Morning, everybody. Please turn, if you do have a Bible, to Luke chapter 5. We're we're picking up and continuing our series through the early chapters of Luke's gospel this morning. And uh, this morning we come to Luke 5, verses 1 to 32. Uh, This has been a real joy to spend, for me to spend time in these verses this week. Uh, And and so I'm anticipating it'll be a real joy for us to do it together now as well. Um, As you're turning there, let me ask you, have, have you ever felt like you're not good enough for something? Or perhaps it would be better to ask, how often do you feel like you're not good enough for something? Uh, Maybe it's a particular sport you'd love to play, you'd love to be good at, but you really have never been good enough to make the team. Uh, Maybe it's a job you wish you had, but you just don't think you match up. Maybe you feel you're not good enough to get into a particular circle of friends or to build a relationship with one particular individual in particular. Or perhaps you found yourself wondering if you're good enough at times for church, if you're good enough to come here on a Sunday morning. Maybe you walked in even this morning and and, and there was this thought in your head, I'm not sure I am really good enough to be here. Maybe you've even found yourself wondering at times, am I good enough for Jesus? Good enough to come to him? Good enough even to qualify for his help? Or do I need to change myself, make changes in my life first before I can turn to him for help. Our passage this morning contains four episodes, four events, four stories, all tied together by this one question of who it is that Jesus has come to help. Who is it that Jesus calls to be his followers? Did he come for the spiritually healthy 
or the spiritually sick? That's our question this morning. Did he come for those who morally had it all together or, or at least somewhat together? Or for those who morally were in an utterly lost mess? Now, I don't want to leave us hanging on for the answer to this so important question this morning. So let me just point out right at the start uh, of this time the verse that ends our passage this morning because it's summed up beautifully in the last couple of verses. Verse 31 of Luke 5, And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So if you're the kind of person this morning who loves to turn to the end of a book before you start it, just to make sure it's got a happy ending, is it worth reading, is it going to turn out well? Well, this is where we're heading, to a, to a humbling but very happy ending. But what Luke then does for us on the journey to get there is he presents us, as I say, with these four real, living, breathing, human examples of this truth in action. We're going to see it in the example of a fisherman, a leper, a paralytic man, and a tax collector. And Luke shows us that not only did Jesus not come to call the righteous but sinners, but he actually came to call the very worst of sinners. He came to call, in fact, those who have given up all hope of ever being good enough for God in and of themselves. And it's this that we're going to take our time this morning to explore together. Uh, in the opening words of a hymn that I came across just this week, and I've borrowed for my sermon title, uh, a couple of lines go like this. Jesus, sinners, does receive. Oh, may all this saying ponder. And God has gifted us now with some uninterrupted time together in the middle of maybe what's been a really busy week for you, but now some uninterrupted time from God to ponder these things together. And the first thing we see here in verses 1 to 11 is that Jesus came to call the sinful. So let's read from verse 1 through to verse 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This here really is quite the miracle. Jesus is continuing to teach and preach his message. His fame is spreading and the crowds coming to hear him are growing. And so much so that they're, they're pressing in on him. It's like a crowd of people eager to, you know, like we think about people eager to get into the sales at the shops or a concert somewhere or, or eager to uh, buy a new book or, or something new game that's just come out. These people are pressing in, eager to hear Jesus teaching the word. So much so that Jesus decides to get into a nearby fishing boat to make it into a floating pulpit so that everyone can continue to see him and hear him as he teaches. Now, his teaching here is not actually the main focus, though, of the passage. Though, again, I think it's really inspiring to see how eager people are to come and hear him. But here the real spectacle comes when Jesus tells Simon to take them out into the deep part of the lake again, where Simon and the others have already been fishing all night already. They've caught nothing at all. But Jesus tells them, go and put your nets down again. And reluctantly, they do. And all of a sudden, we've just seen it. Their nets are full to bursting. In fact, they are bursting. There's so many fish now. 
An unimaginable number of fish in their nets. And so they call their friends along in the other boat. They put the fish in there as well. The boats are now, both of them, sinking under the weight of this incredible catch. And the question I think we've got to ask ourselves is, how would we respond? Perhaps for some of us, our minds would be immediately on the windfall of profit that's now going to be coming our way because of all these fish. Or maybe our minds would go to the damage to our equipment. I'm going to have to fix these nets again. Or maybe even the danger of the boats now capsizing. Maybe some of us that particularly don't like being out in the water starting to panic. We're going down. All of those would have been understandable ways to respond. But, but what is Simon Peter's response to what happens here? He falls down at Jesus' knees and says, depart from me. Why does Simon do that? What, what is it that Simon has seen? Well, really, he, he's just seen two things. Two things that have just come into, into sharp focus, into much clearer focus for him. First of all, he's just witnessed something of Jesus' mighty power over creation. Something of the glory of the Son of God incarnate. Previously, you might have noticed he called him master. It was a term of respect. Now he calls him Lord. He's seeing Jesus more clearly now. But the second thing Simon's seeing more clearly now than ever before is himself. Himself in comparison to this miracle worker that's in the boat. And Peter is undone. Simon Peter is undone. It, it, it made me think of Isaiah. You may be familiar with the passage of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah was undone when he saw the vision of God's holiness and glory filling and overflowing the temple. Isaiah's response on that occasion was, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Peter's response is a bit shorter, but I think it's in essence the same. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I am a man full of sin. Like Adam and Eve trying to hide themselves from God in the garden when they sinned. Like Israel trembling at the, mount of, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai, begging Moses not to let God speak to them. Peter now sees himself as he really is. And he's ashamed and he's afraid at being in the presence of a holy God. And maybe you at times have felt the same. You've caught glimpses, maybe more than glimpses, of the holiness and the goodness and the glory of God. And you've seen yourself illuminated in that light. It's like a spotlight's been shone on you. And as a result, you've seen even more of the blackness of your own sin. Calvin once said, no one ever attains clear knowledge of self unless... He has first gazed upon the face of the Lord. And when we first begin to see what God is really like, it can be a terrifying sight. Not because he's not altogether good, but because we realize in that moment that we are fundamentally not. That we are fundamentally not good, not in comparison to God. That's what Simon's now thinking. But then look at how Jesus responds to him. Just look at how Jesus responds. He responds with what is actually one of the most repeated phrases of God in all of the Bible. This, this is, God speaks these words again and again. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Now you notice what Jesus doesn't say here. He doesn't say, come on now, Simon, you're not that bad. Or don't worry, your, your sin, it's not really a big deal. He doesn't try to make Simon feel better about himself or, or, or water down the conviction that Simon is now feeling. But what he does say is, don't be afraid. Fear not. And then he gives Simon a new commission. From now on, you will be catching men. So let's just reflect on that for a moment. Who is Jesus calling? Who is Simon? Simon? Not a righteous man, but a man who knows himself to be a sinner. A man who knows himself to be full of sin. And Jesus says he's going to make this sinner a fisher of men. He's going to send Simon out to call other people to come to Jesus too. Well, what kind of people is Simon going to call? Fellow sinners just like him and me and you. 
And so we see here the first living, breathing illustration in our passage this morning that Jesus came not to call the good and the devout and the righteous, but sinners to come and find rescue and forgiveness and new life in him. He came to call the sinful. And Jesus is still in the business of calling the sinful today. Are you convinced yet by Simon's example? Don't worry if you're not there yet. We have three more compelling examples to go. Number two, Jesus came to call the unclean. Verse 12, look at verse 12. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. Now, just to pause there, leprosy was one of the most feared diseases of the day. It brought sores and decay to a person's skin, their body. It poisoned their blood and it brought rottenness to the bones that were underneath. A person with leprosy would literally experience their body gradually rotting away. And there was no cure. What made it even worse is it was highly contagious. And under the law of Moses, a person with leprosy was considered ritually unclean. And all of this together meant that leprosy was just like the most terrible death sentence. Like a, like a living death. Even before it finally killed you. With the leper cut off from friends and family not allowed to draw near to the temple for worship or do all of the ordinary everyday things that we love to do, not allowed to come into contact with or be touched by anybody, even the closest family member. And this man as well, we're told, was full of leprosy. He was at an advanced stage. He he must have looked quite a horrible picture as he came towards Jesus. And we're meant, of course, to see here in his physical condition something of our spiritual condition as well. Leprosy is intended at many times throughout the Bible to paint a picture of you and I in our sin. J.C. Ryle says this about lepers. What are we all but spiritual lepers in the sight of God? Sin is the deadly leprosy by which we are all affected. It has eaten into our vitals. It has infected all our faculties, heart, conscience, mind and will. All are diseased by sin. From the sole of our foot to the crown of our head, there is no soundness in us, only welts and wounds and putrefying sores. Such is the state in which we are all born. Such is the state in which we all naturally live. We are in one sense dead, long before we are laid in the grave. Our bodies may be healthy and active, but our souls are by nature dead in trespasses and sins. So the leper here, he's put here as a test case. A test case of whether Jesus can do anything and whether Jesus is willing to do anything for people that are so far gone and so spiritually unclean as this leper and as you and me. Is Jesus able and is he willing? This man is at least prepared to go and ask the question. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, You can make me clean. And then Jesus, in the sight of everyone, remember there's crowds always around, in the sight of everyone, does the unthinkable. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. See, here we see, even before we get to the miracle, we see the the compassion and the mercy of Jesus on display in the most profound way towards the physically and spiritually unclean. No one is allowed to touch a leper. Anyone who does so will themselves be made unclean, except here, as Jesus reaches out and touches the man, it is not the man's uncleanness that spreads to Jesus, but Jesus' cleanness that spreads to the leper. Now, of course, we know later on as well, that uncleanness from the leper and from all of our sin will be transferred to Jesus So we've got a little foreshadowing here of the cross. But right now, it's the cleanness of Jesus that spreads to this most unclean of men. And with a simple word of command, be clean, immediately the leprosy leaves him, verse 13. And he charged him, Jesus charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. Again, the spiritual link is made. As a result of Jesus taking away his leprosy, this man is brought back into the spiritual community of God's people. He's brought back into a place where he can draw near to God. 
And so we see magnificently demonstrated for the second time this morning that Jesus has come not for the righteous and the respectable, but for the leper and the sinful and the unclean. And he is both able and willing. Just seen that. Able and willing, mighty and merciful, to restore and make clean all who draw near with such a plea. As the invitation in another old hymn goes, Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, joined with power. Love that. Love the truths of these old hymns. Uh, Okay, perhaps someone still here, sat here this morning, not yet fully convinced that this could truly be Jesus' purpose. Could this really be the Christian message? Rescue not for the righteous, but for sinners. I know it seems too good to be true. So next, Luke presents us with a third case study to further convince us this morning. He's not done with us yet. And this time he shows us that Jesus came to call those whose greatest need is forgiveness. Uh, Let's read from verse 15. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and the great crowds gathered to hear him and be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles, into the midst, before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. This third little episode, I think it deliberately uh, poses us with two questions to ponder. The first of them isn't stated explicitly, but I'm sure there must have been many people there that day. And the first question is this, is Jesus paying attention? Uh, We've all been guilty at times, I'm sure. I get accused of this a lot. uh, Of finding ourselves in a busy room with lots of people. Maybe we're focusing on something we're doing or even focusing on something we're saying and we're not really paying attention to what's going on in front of us. The question is, is that what Jesus is doing here? Is, Is Jesus paying attention? Because here is a man in need of Jesus's help and here are his friends looking down from above through the hole in the roof. The man is paralyzed but out of out of the love of his friends, because they've believed the news about Jesus' healing power, they've carried their friend on a bed all the way to the place where Jesus is in town. On arrival, they find the crowd is again tightly pressing in. Undeterred, they climb up onto the flat roof and remove some tiles, and they lower their friend down on his bed. Just, I mean, that's a fair effort, isn't it? Lower a fully grown man down on his bed into the room to lay him at the feet of Jesus. And it's obvious to everyone why they've done this, why they've gone to such great effort to bring him to Jesus. They have brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus to be healed. They want to hear Jesus say to him, be healed. But instead, Luke tells us the first thing Jesus says to him is, man, your sins are forgiven you. Which begs the question, is Jesus paying attention? Why does he prioritize forgiveness of sins over the surely far more obvious need of healing? And the only answer that makes sense, because Jesus is always paying attention, the only answer then that makes sense is that Jesus considers this man's greatest need to be for forgiveness. What this means is that with whatever more obvious paralysis that you and I might bring to Jesus, be it sickness or sorrow or suffering, the truly deepest need you and I bring, which his loving and merciful eye always so clearly perceives, is our need for God to forgive us. And the glorious good news of the gospel is that Christ came down from heaven to earth to meet our deepest need. He came to give us precisely what we most need, even when it was the most costly thing that he could bring to us, complete forgiveness. So that was the first question. Now this raises the second vital question here, and this one is explicit in the text. Is Jesus able to do this? We've seen him do some some profound things so far, but is he able to do this thing? 
Verse 21, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And the scribes and the Pharisees, of course, they're not entirely wrong here. It's true that only God can forgive sins. But what the Pharisees can't see, or maybe they refuse to see, is who this is who is right in front of them, forgiving sins. If only they would humble themselves. If only they would come and recognize their deepest need. Maybe they would recognize Jesus in this moment. But Jesus is about to give them compelling proof. This isn't blasphemy. Compelling proof that he really has come to meet the deepest of all of our needs. Verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. Jesus comes. He came with the complete authority to forgive sins. Jesus came to rescue all those who are willing to recognize that this is my greatest need. And Jesus offers this same complete forgiveness to everyone here this morning who is willing to humble themselves and repent and believe. I love the words of Douglas Milne here. He says, when Jesus forgives, he does so fully, for no sin is too shameful or unpardonable. Permanently, for God separates us from our sins forever. Unconditionally, for we cannot make ourselves worthy of his forgiveness. And immediately, for our sins are gone the moment we believe. This man's friends on this day, they arrived carrying a heavy burden. Carrying their friend. If you've ever carried a person, you know how heavy they can be. They arrived carrying a heavy burden. Maybe you arrived this morning carrying a heavy burden too. Perhaps you came in here, Christian or not yet Christian, but, but weighed down with a, a burden of guilt for your sins. But look at this. This man's friends went home burden-free after meeting Jesus, not only because they were no longer carrying their friend, he was walking, but because he and they, by their faith in Jesus, went home no longer carrying the burden of their sin. They went home a group of happy friends together, forgiven. And so too can you this morning so too do you, if you're a believer already this morning, you came in forgiven and you will go from here forgiven as well. Jesus came to call those whose greatest need is forgiveness. He came again not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sinners, honestly, just like you and me, as bad as you and me. No matter how black our past, no matter how ungodly and wicked we may have been. And in fact, fourthly and finally this morning, we see in the final example of a tax collector, how Jesus came to call even the worst of sinners. Verse 27, here's our final little episode this morning. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. Uh, now, when I was younger, I had to wrestle with sharing this. I was very young, I'll just stress that. Um, there was an animated children's show I used to watch called The Raggy Dolls. I may have been watching it with my sister as well, if that makes it any better, okay? Uh, but it was all about a group of dolls in a toy factory who came alive when everyone else had gone home at the end of the night. And the reason they were called the Raggy Dolls and the reason that they had to live in the factory is because due to their imperfections, they'd all been rejected and thrown in the bin, in the reject bin. They were the dolls that no one wanted. But of course, you could probably guess the essence of the show was that these were still very good-natured dolls. They, they were cute and endearing, and uh, they looked after each other with the utmost kindness each week. Uh, children watching were, of course, being encouraged to look below the surface when they meet people, to not judge people simply based on how they look from the outside. It was a good message. But what about when the imperfections do run deep beneath the surface in us? What about when we get rejected even by other people 
precisely because of the terrible sins that we commit against them, the things we do to wrong them. In first century Roman-occupied Israel, no one was more universally condemned, understandably condemned, and rejected by their own people than men like Levi, who were willing to betray their own people and swindle them and steal from them daily by agreeing to collect taxes for Rome. Mike McKinley says this, For a faithful Jew in those days, it would be hard to imagine a more loathsome and hated person in all of society than Levi. Tax collectors were commonly viewed as the ultimate sinners, the enemies of God and his people. Surely these were the kinds of people that the Messiah, the Christ Jesus, would oppose and punish when he arrived. Levi sat in his little booth, is no cute and rejected raggy doll, waiting for someone to see the good beneath the surface. Everyone who knows him sees pretty accurately what lies beneath And they hate him for his sin and the wrongs that he's done for them. And I wonder maybe is that you could be someone here this morning. Perhaps you feel like you could never really truly become a Christian. Not because you don't want to, but because you you have friends and family and acquaintances from the past that you know you've, you've wronged and you've sinned against in grievous ways. And with so many wrongs done and so many people that know about it and so many people upset with you, holding these things against you, you can't see how God could ever call you now to follow him. Not to mention maybe what all these other people might think if you turn around and said, I've become a Christian. But what does Jesus say to a person like this? It's all that matters. What does Jesus say to someone whose own neighbors and family have rejected him? Verse 27, and Jesus said to Levi, follow me. Jesus says, to even the worst of sinners, follow me. And then just look at the effect that this profoundly merciful invitation has on Levi. Verse 28, and leaving everything, Levi rose and followed him. In an instant, Levi drops everything connected to his old corrupt way of life, gets up and follows Jesus. Levi here is a profound reminder that no one is ever beyond the reach of God's grace. No one is ever so far gone in sin, never has too many years of godlessness behind them. No one is so guilty of wrongdoing against others or so hard-hearted and opposed to God himself that they cannot be saved and transformed by Jesus. No sins are too bad or too many to be forgiven and paid for at the cross. No ears are so deaf that a single word, maybe two words, of invitation from Jesus can't open those ears wide and allow the gospel to come flooding into a stony heart and bring that person to new life. And this one who called Levi, he still lives and still calls even the worst of sinners today. His voice has not lost one decibel of its power to save. He can call even you to saving faith. And a new life of following him today. And he is inviting you right now. If you're not a Christian here this morning, he is inviting you right now as you sit here listening to his word. These words are for you. Follow me. And immediately, Levi wants to celebrate. But not only does he want to celebrate his own conversion. And there really is no other event in a person's life that is more exciting and worth celebrating forevermore than our being converted But he also wants his friends now to meet Jesus. He's he's an instant keen um, witness. He wants his friends to know. Levi immediately goes fishing for people. Just like Jesus sent Simon immediately out to fish for other sinners too. Verse 29, and Levi made Jesus a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors. All the other really rotten people. All of Levi's old friends. His tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. Levi does what Jesus would like all of us to do. He invites all of his godless friends to meet Jesus for themselves. He's not ashamed, first of all, to be known now as a follower of Jesus. He knows he's rotten, but he thinks Jesus is great. He's not ashamed for it to be known that Jesus has rescued him. But he's also not ashamed to bring the very worst of people, the worst of friends, the worst of sinners, to meet Jesus. Well, not everyone, of course, is happy 
And you could probably, we could probably guess who. We're going to read on and find out. But you can probably guess, verse 30. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And, and then Jesus answered them. And here's that summary line that we started with at the beginning. Those who are well have no need of a physician, a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why would God send his son not to the righteous and deserving, but to the sinful and undeserving? Why would God, the holy God, act in this way? Why would God defile himself like this? That's what the Pharisees cannot get their heads around. And Jesus' answer is this, because all those who are well have no need of a doctor. And that's true, isn't it? How, how many of us, I hope we're not just pestering the doctor for no reason, how many of us go to see the doctor when there's nothing wrong with us, when we don't think there's anything wrong with us? Almost none of us go when that's the case. There'd be no point. We know that doctors are there wonderfully to help the sick. And so it is with Jesus. He didn't come to treat the spiritually healthy, to give them a pat on the back and say, well done, keep, keep going, you're doing so well. He came to treat the spiritually sick. He came from heaven to earth to treat the sinners and the rebels and the outcasts. And he was willing to go out into the highways and the byways to find them, to find us. He didn't remain sitting in heaven waiting for us to find our way up to him. He came down and out to look for us, to find the lost sheep to call to himself those who realize they have nothing in themselves to warrant his attention, to call to himself those who in his light see only their own sin and uncleanness and need for forgiveness. The only kind of person Jesus didn't come to call are those who are healthy, those who are righteous, like the Pharisees thought they were. The Pharisees had so long hold, held on to their pride and the illusion of their being generally healthy and acceptable in God's eyes that when the Savior came along, when the, when the divine doctor came to meet their greatest need, they could not see their need for him one bit. They thought they had no need of the great physician. And so long as they clung to that idea, that pride, that arrogance, they would not turn to Jesus for rescue, even though they really need to. The reality is, the Bible tells us, there is no one righteous, there's no one healthy. No, not one. We are all of us, all four of these case studies this morning. You don't have to go home and say, which one of these am I? We're all of them. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Christ died for sinners. He died, he was the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. And so the question for all of us this morning is, have we recognized the gravity of our sin like Peter did? Have we asked Jesus to make us clean like the leper did? Have we accepted that our greatest need in all of the world is for God to forgive us like he forgave the paralytic? And are we willing to drop everything and begin to follow Jesus like Levi the chief of sinners did. This is what it means to become a Christian. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Again, Jesus invites you, if you're here this morning and you've, you've never yet done this, he invites you to come to him this morning, empty-handed, in repentance, with mercy and love, he invites you to come. But what about this morning, those of us who've already come empty-handed to Jesus? And we've become his followers maybe many weeks or months or years before. Why do we need to keep being reminded of this message of grace this morning? Why, why is the Bible so full of this message? Well, I think it's more than anything else because we are so prone to forget it. We're prone at times, on the one hand, to forget how serious our condition was and to some extent still is. Even as Christians, we can begin over time. We once, we once were in awe of God's grace to us, but now we can begin to become self-righteous and like the Pharisees, thinking that maybe we can do this on our own. But we're also prone, I think, on the other hand, even more to forget 
how completely Jesus has already rescued us. We are so prone at times to fall back into fresh condemnation, to being freshly struck by the weight of our sin while forgetting the even greater mercy of Jesus. Sometimes just the fact that Jesus came to save the worst of sinners can begin to feel too good to be true. At least that's how it feels to me. I sin again, fall into sin, and I think I've gone too far this time. Surely even his mercy doesn't extend to me. It seems too good to be true. We can begin to question even, does the Bible really teach this? Or is this just some overly gracious spin that certain churches who want to call themselves Grace Church and gospel-centered, that that Christians have just imposed this on the message of the Bible? We're here this morning, we've seen four times over in quadraphonic sound, in Dolby surround sound, from the pages of God's own word, this message is truly here, divinely taught and illustrated for us in real people's lives. That Jesus came not for the righteous but for sinners and that what qualifies us to keep coming back to him day after day after day, sin after sin, is not that even as Christians we've now made ourselves better or done our best. No, what qualifies us day after day is that though we are great sinners, we have put our trust in a very great saviour. And in his great mercy he has reached out and he has laid hold of us like he took hold of that leper He has shed his precious blood for us. He has spoken to every believer the words we've heard him speaking here. He said to you, if you're a believer, do not be afraid. I am willing. Be clean. Your sins are forgiven you. Now follow me. Finally, now my conscience is at peace. This is how the hymn continues that I began with at the start. Now my conscience is at peace. From the law I stand acquitted. Christ has purchased my release and my every sin remitted. Jesus, sinners, does receive. Even I have been forgiven. And when I this earth must leave, I shall find an open heaven. Let's pray. Let's give thanks. Father, we do thank you for your gracious, glorious, life-giving word to us this morning. We thank you for Jesus, your one and only Son, who came not to save and call the righteous, but sinners, even the very worst of sinners, even sinners like us. Lord, we pray, please help us then to leave here with fresh confidence this morning, confident in our Saviour Jesus, confident in his life and death for us, confident in his saving blood. And Lord, we pray, may we also go with fresh confidence this morning that the message of the gospel is still your power for salvation to all who hear and believe it, that it makes the sinner whole. May our own experience of its life-changing remedy give us greater joy now and boldness and courage to share it with other sin-sick sinners like us. Help us, Lord, we pray, not to be at all ashamed to introduce our friends and our neighbours to Jesus. Help us, we pray, together as a church to be increasingly fruitful fishers of men. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand, let's sing together. Who 
crucified your son, rejoice around your throne. Well, then. 
morning for your kindness reminding us afresh through your word the power of saving grace our sins are many your mercy is more Lord thank you that none of us are beyond the reach of your grace and your mercy Lord, we're amazed when we consider how holy you are and how sinful we are, that you would save us from the penalty of that sin. And now we know that our lives are forever secure in Christ. Lord, thank you for reminding us afresh. Thank you, Lord, for the line in this song when, and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed, kissed the guilty world in love. Thank you, Lord, that your love is as vast as the ocean. It's immeasurable. We cannot measure it. But, Lord, thank you this morning. We have experienced it. And we know that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So thank you, Lord, for ministering to us afresh this morning. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, To this end we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good work and work of faith by his power. So the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a wonderful afternoon. Tea and coffee at the back. If anybody would like prayer, then please come and speak to us.